हरे कृष्णा सो इन अमेरिका राइट नाउ देर इज अ साधु संघ फेस्टिवल गोइंग ऑन एवरी ईयर इट हैपन्स इन लॉन्ग देर लॉन्ग वीकेंड सो वेर मेनी डिवोटीज कम टूगेदर एंड डू आवर्स एंड आवर्स ऑफ कीर्तन सो आई वॉज जस्ट टॉकिंग विथ वन डिवोटी ही हेर बीन इन्वाइटिंग मी टू कम देर फॉर द कीर्तन फेस्टिवल आई टोल्ड हिम राइट नाउ आई एम इन द कीर्तन फेस्टिवल ओनली सो इट्स वंडरफुल टू सी द टेस्ट ऑफ ऑल ऑफ यू फॉर हरिनाम फॉर हरिनाम संकीर्तन एंड नाउ आई एल टॉक अबाउट आई एस्टर डे आई वॉज टॉकिंग अबाउट द स्टोरी ऑफ विश्वामित्र क्विकली रिकैप टिल वॉट पॉइंट आई हेड कम एंड देन विल मूव फॉरवर्ड we are basically talking about how from scripture we can learn about the challenges that we will face in our lives and how we can deal with those challenges sometimes some people ask that the scriptures were written thousands of years ago and are they really relevant today we all live in different situations we have different kinds of problems yes it's true at one level that our situation is very different but more than the external problems that face us what defines our life most is the internal challenges that face us and in some ways we are realizing this in today's world also where people have phenomenal material comforts and still also have alarming levels of unhappiness like if you want to use two words to describe modern society is two words would be comfortably miserable <laughs> <laughs> we are comfortable we are far more comfortable in the past but we are still miserable so just working to improve our externals to ch- if we just focus on the externals of the world that we are in and the world that was described thousands of years ago in scripture it might seem quite different and it is different not just might seem but the internal world still remains the same just as whether we are li- whether we are flying on in by planes or whether we are walking on foot on the earth that doesn't make any difference to how the skies are illuminated the sun, same sun and moon are illuminating the universe in day and night irrespective of what mode of transport we use on the earth similarly scripture gives us timeless truths and of course there are specific variations which may not apply but the timeless principles do apply so we are looking at vishwamitra's story from that perspective of a timeless journey that every one of us has to go through and i talked yesterday about how vishwamitra when he was very powerful as a king the nature of power is that one becomes it often makes people power hungry he wanted more and more power and he tried to grab the source of vashishtha's power that was his surabhi cow and when he was thwarted not once but twice first by the surbhi cow itself producing an endless army of soldiers and then by vashishtha using a mystical staff to counter all his weapons actually there are multiple stages what happens is initially vishwam vishwamitra tries to get the better of Kshat, of, Bra, of vashishtha by kshatriya means only it is normally if one kshatriya warrior is fighting with another kshatriya warrior if they can't win then maybe i need to get better weapons so he does tapasya to satisfy shiva and gets a whole arsenal of celestial weapons but still that time when he attacks vashishtha vashishtha just uses his staff and with the staff he counters all his weapons and he is shocked to see this so <coughs> in the search for power when he is thwarted he realizes that okay kshatriya power can't match brahmanical power so let me get brahmanical power so he decides to do austerities now not just so that he can get some more weapons but to get brahmanical power and at that time he is first brought down by desire i talked about 
how Menaga came first. So now for all of us, we all, based on our situations in our life, we set some goals for ourselves. And even if somebody just wants to achieve something materially without any spiritual life involved, but even for material achievement, some people require discipline. I talked about our impulses, how they can distract us. So when he resisted that temptation, uh, and transcended that, then the next came to him was anger. So desire and anger are a binary. In the Dharmic tradition, it is said that uh, uh, Krodha is Kama Anuja. Anuja is the younger brother. Yesterday I talked about how anger expressed outward is aggression. Anger expressed inward is depression. When we are depressed, basically we are just so angry with ourselves. Why am I not good enough? Why am I not good enough? So we see both these forms of ang anger in today's world. And in some ways, it's just frustrated desire, which is manifesting in that way. So then when he came, when he was again performing austerities, at that time, Indra, who was insecure, sent another Apsara. When Rambha came before him, now he was alert. Now he was not going to fall for that same temptation. But what happens in general is that whenever we try to control our senses, and even when we con succeed in controlling our senses, the result of that inner control is that it increases our conception that we are controllers. This is a subtle way in which Arthas attack us. So if we are not able to control ourselves itself, then we may not have so much of a conception of a controller. I think I am a controller till the urge to eat, till the urge to watch this, till the urge to do this hits me and I am pulled. But the more we are able to control ourselves, the more what happens is the conception that I am a controller starts coming in. And as that conception that I am the controller starts increasing, we start becoming more and more intolerant toward anything that disrupts our sense of control. And that's how sometimes it happens that people who are very self-controlled are also in terms of desire also tend to be short-tempered. They, people who are very disciplined in terms of, say, uh, their spiritual practices, they, they are very disciplined and regulated, but any disruption is a, is a very strong overreaction to that. So what is happening? They, they have created a cocoon of control. And anybody who disrupts that, they overreact. So uh, it's often talked about, especially sages, who practice spiritual life without really connecting with the Supreme Lord. They are very vulnerable to anger. Of course, we want to control desire. It's not that we shouldn't have self-control. But the purpose of self-control is not to gain control over the outer world. The purpose of self-control is to offer the self to the Supreme Controller. We want self-control so that we can serve Krishna better. And serving Krishna better means, okay, whatever situation I am putting in, I am the servant of Krishna, let me see how best I can serve. So in this case, when Rambha came before him, at that time, he did not fall for desire. But what happened to him was, he fell for anger. I am so determined I am going to succeed. How dare this person come and try to tempt me? And when he had that anger burst out from within him. That anger burst out and he cursed Ramba. Now his, sometimes what happens is self-control can make us very hard-hearted. Because we just, you know, we, we are dismissing all emotions as sentimentality. And he cursed her and she became a stone. Of course, because she had come on Indra's behalf. So Indra eventually rescued her. But at this point, what happened? 
whenever anybody does any any uh, austerity they gain certain power by that however the nature of power is that just like we say lakshmi is fickle wealth comes and wealth goes some people say money talks you know, if somebody comes in a very big car or wearing very wealthy dress and everybody pays attention to him pays such a person says money talks it's true but money talks and walks away while it is talking <laughs> what it means is that the more we demonstrate money for demonstrating that money money is being spent so like we are talking with someone and while talking only they walk away from us hey, what happened why did you go away so like that people who just center themselves on exhibiting a lot of money which they have soon they find that they run out of money the same applies to any kind of power if we don't use it wisely it will be lost and when he when he had that mystic power and he used that to curse ramba what happened he lost that power and again he fell back now what exactly do we mean by this loss of power the power when we are talking about it's not like a it's not like a bank account where there's a withdrawal and you find that oh, i had 1 million dollars and now i have only 100 dollars what happened it is not as literally physical like that but the idea is that if we can consider our i just today i talked about how uh, our consciousness is our most important resource to be distracted is to be disempowered whatever we want to do in life we if you want to study it would be great if we have very good memory if we have good analytical skills if we have good articulation skills all these are good but all these can be used only if our consciousness is in control if we are distracted we can't do anything so our consciousness is our most fundamental resource and this consciousness as we focus on something it becomes concentrated and directed in a purposeful way but when we let that consciousness get misdirected in a excessive way in some direction that concentrated focus that power is lost so when he fell prey to anger in that way he again got frustrated he again got frustrated no i'm not going to get distracted like this so now now what do we do about anger sometimes some some what happens for all of us we all get angry and when we get angry sometimes our devotion might justify our anger also we say my anger like hanuman's anger in burning lanka we may, if we start thinking like that the problem with that is that even hanuman regrets his anger after he burns lanka he start thinking hey did i burn the ashok vatika also this fire spread there or sita burnt if sita was burnt then what a fool i am my whole purpose was defeated and starts berating himself for that and at that time a celestial voice comes saying that sita is safe do not fear so the point is hanuman is not jubilant about using his anger in krishna's in the in the lord ram service he uses it that's what is required but the nature of anger is that it can go off course it can become excessive so one of the uh, of course managing anger is a itself a diff, big subject but broadly speaking all of us whether it is to manage desire or to manage, manage anger we need to develop our own pause button now when a emotion comes within us if 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 there is anger within us if we express it what will happen other people will burn how dare you speak like this but if we repress it we will burn because we we'll just feel choked by it and anger if it is kept within us for a very long time anger when solidified becomes hatred the anger is temporary just bursts out as an expression but when anger stays on for a long 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 time it becomes solidified and it becomes like hatred this constant animosity towards someone so we can't we we can't just restrict repress anger but we can't just express anger so what we need to do is 
process anger. And processing begins by developing our own pause button. Pause button means that when a particular emotion comes up, we don't say no to it, we don't say yes to it, we pause it. Now pausing can broadly be done by two things, change of situation and change of perspective. Change of situation means sometimes a particular situation is triggering us. Then it's important that we move out of that situation. If we are in a place where we are being provoked and we stay on in that situation, we will catch fire. Now, all of us are inflammable. The degree of inflammability may be variable, but every one of us is inflammable. And if we are in a provocative situation, you catch, catch fire. So the change of situation is not a permanent solution, but at least at that time, let's not make things worse. Change of perspective means we look at things in a different way. We change our way of looking at things. And that is where our Krishna consciousness is meant to come into picture. So when we say, somebody may say, oh, when you feel angry or when, when you feel anger or feel, feel desire, just chant Hare Krishna. Now, what does it mean? Chanting Hare Krishna is not just a ritual. Chanting Hare Krishna is meant to change our thoughts, change our perspective. Chanting Hare Krishna means actually it's a mood that Krishna, I'm your servant. Please engage me in your service. So at that time, we have to find out what pause button works best for us. For some of us, it might be chanting. For some of us, it might be remembering some verses from scripture. Some, from scripture. For some of us, it might be remembering some points which we might have heard in some class about how dangerous anger is. For some of us, it might just be not trying to... Sometimes we just try to resist the anger. Sometimes we don't try to fight the anger. We just move towards somewhere else. We shift our thoughts somewhere else. So for example, if you just hear some soothing kirtan music, Look at a beautiful picture of Krishna. Read something pacifying. And then we direct our thoughts elsewhere. So, basically, we need to find out which pause button works for us. And if we don't have a pause button, then we'll be, we'll be, we'll be battered. So, in this case, as he went onwards, he now he was angry, but he overcame that anger. And he started becoming more and more powerful. And as he gained more and more power, then more and more people started saying, oh, you're also a great sage. Now what happens, we all can be motivated to do a particular thing in different ways. There is competition is just a fact of life. But competition can be constructive or it can be destructive. Destructive competition means that we are not concerned with how high we rise, we are concerned with pulling anyone else who is rising above us. So destructive competition is definitely unhealthy. So Vishwamitra had a great desire to try to prove that I am better than Vashishta. That I, am, I have become greater than Vashishta. And this being other centered is never a healthy state of mind. Normally, we think of attachment as something undesirable. If you are too attached to someone, then we are constantly thinking about that person, constantly thinking about that person's pleasure, that person, whether that person is pleased with me or not. Of course, we have to have a service attitude, but attachment can be quite distracting. However, just as attachment can be distracting, aversion can also be distracting. Say, you know, if we come for a come for a program and we are already attached to someone then you are constantly looking at is that person here, is that person here, is that person here and but if you are averse to someone we come to the temple we are constantly has that person come, has that person come you know, we may be we may come to the temple and be taking the darshan of the Lord but we are as soon as we hear that person's voice we hear something that seems to be that, person, that person's voice immediately our thoughts go in that direction so aversion can be as distracting as at attachment and when this happens the, you know, some people say I love humanity it is human beings I can't tolerate <laughs> what that means to abstract sense to love humanity is very easy but a specific sense to actually deal with people is a challenge mm. so uh, Vishwamitra, because he had, he was still other centered. He was centered on Vashishta and tried to prove that I am better than Vashishta. And generally, 
in the world wherever anybody is powerful there are people around who know how to press the buttons of someone powerful and how to get that person to do something for us so <clears throat> there was a king in the dynasty of ram and dashrath long before him his name was Ikshi, was trishanku and this king had a peculiar desire not that the desire itself was peculiar but that his his way he was very open brazen about expressing it he said i want to go to heaven now that's okay it everybody wants to attain a, everybody who knows that there is something beyond this world wants to attain a better world now almost any most people their house if you go if they has a dharmic background and some ancestors have passed away they write swargavasi or kailashwasi very few people actually write vikundavasi but swargavasi they write now we really don't know whether they are going to swargavas or where they have gone but that is the hope people in general have so but the normal way to go to heaven is by living piously in this world and then leaving our body here and getting a heavenly body to enter into that world once prabhupada was asked is there life on other planets and prabhupada said of course why would krishna waste so much space <laughs> we see in this world in a small in a small crack inside the earth there are some some and some insects and millions and billions of uh, males of our space why would it get wasted all that honest scientists could say is that life as we know it has not been found in the cosmos as far as we have seen it so they can only make a qualified statement but one of the fundamental principles is that life in the vedic cosmology is that everywhere life exists but not as we know it although in our in our pictures in our in our paintings or our pictures we might depict celestial beings just like us but their bodies of completely different nature it's made of subtler elements that's why even if the devatas come to the earth uh, unless they bless us with vision we can't see them so anyway so the point was that when when trishanku wanted to go to swarga uh, the normal way to go to swarga is that we give up this body and then Uh, if you had done enough piety you will attain heaven but trishanku wanted that i want to go to heaven in this body itself in this body itself see there is a difference between piety and spirituality between punya and bhakti when when we are spiritual we understand that i am the soul and i have a body but when we are pious we think i am the body and i have a soul i am the body and i have a soul that's why their, their idea is that if my body is lost i am lost so i want this body to go to heaven so then he asked at that by this time vashishta had become the priest of the uh, uh, of the dynasty of the surya vamsha of the solar dynasty so he told him i want to go to heaven in this very body so that's not possible and then he decided no but i want to go then he thought okay maybe there is a way but this sage is not telling me so he says that let me find out on someone else suppose if somebody has some disease and the doctor tells them that this cannot be cured then naturally we want some other opinion can somebody else might know something so then he decides whom to go to he goes to vishwamitra and vishwam and he starts his request only as soon as vishwamitra hears that i want to go to heaven this body vishwamitra is about to say no and he says actually i asked vashishta and he said it is not possible for him so i wanted to know whether it is possible for you see as soon as you put it like that what happens there are different ways in which questions can be put a naive say suppose of somebody is a naive car salesman he asks so they will tell make their pitch and they say so sir would you like to have this car and a very seasoned salesman will say give will make the pitch of the car so sir which car would you like to have the red one the green one or the yellow one now il freedom is never taken away as easily as by giving the illusion of freedom so what happens which car do you want 
the question itself is such that do I really want a car? That option is not given only. So similarly, when you when there are there are some questions called as leading questions. The questions are meant to get the person to give a particular answer. And especially if you're if you are in, in the press and we're giving some interviews, then we have to be very careful about leading questions. So his question was, is it possible for you? But if it's not possible for Shishta, it's possible for you. Now, as soon as he heard, Vashishta said, I cannot do it. This is an opportunity for me to prove that I can do it. So, as I said that, uh, Trishanku exploited the weakness that was there in Vishwamitra. And especially if we have some power, we have some position, uh, we have to be careful that others don't exploit us to serve their own purposes. Because it's very easy that if we have certain buttons and people come to know our buttons, then they press the button and then we get manipulated. So then he said, yes, I can do it. And then he said, you know, he said, he said set in sacrifice over here and I will perform, I will use my mystic power. And he started performing sacrifice. And just as he was sitting there, suddenly he found that he started rising up. Sometimes we might have technology where we just sit down and then suddenly the chair itself moves up. So like that he was sitting and he started rising up, rising up, rising up. And as Vishwamitra was observing, he rose, 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 rose from the earth upward, upward, upward. And then he went to heaven. Now when we say he went to upward to heaven, now this up is not in a simple geographical sense. It's in a up in a karmic sense. What do I mean? What is the difference between geographical and karmic? See, whichever part of the earth we go to, if we ask whether we are in India or whether we are in America or in Australia, if people have some theistic sense, if you ask them where is heaven, they will say up. But the earth is round. So up for India and, Aust and America are opposite. Up for Canada and Australia are different directions. So what is up? So that up is not simplistically just a physical ge geographical up. It's a karmic up. It's in a, it's a, there is a karmic dimension in the Vedic cosmography which is not understood normally. What do I mean by karmic dimension? It's like suppose somebody is working on a big computer, like a mainframe computer, where there are hundred, over a hundred, hundred, hundreds of terminals on that same machine which different people are working. Now different people, according to the position their institution, will have different levels of access. A data entry operator might have just access to certain files. But somebody else, who is maybe this, maybe a big manager, they might have access to files which the data entry operator can't even see and can't even know that they exist. So, so he is that, that, that CEO or that big manager, they are up in the hierarchy. That up is not just a physical position. They are up in the hierarchy and because they are up in the hierarchy, they have access that others don't have. So anyway, he started sending him up to Swarga. And as he started going up to Swarga, you know, Indra suddenly got an alarm signal. The Swarga Loka radar station said, unidentified flying object coming. <laughs> <laughs> and Indra came out, look, what is this? And he saw this human being rising up, rising up, rising up in his mortal body. And then Indra used his celestial power and slammed him. And he started coming down, collapsing, coming down. And Vishwamitra saw, oh, Krishanku is coming up. He again used all his cosmic might, all his mystic power, and Trishanku started rising up. And Indra, he said, how dare he come up? He said, going down. So here, what happened was, that Trishanku became like a tennis ball. <laughs> Up, down, up, down, up, down. And Trishanku said, hey, what is this? He said, you know, he said to Vishwamitra, you promised me heaven, but what is happening? I'm going up and down. So now Vishwamitra was very powerful, but still he couldn't get in the, he couldn't get Trishanku to fo force his way into Swarga. So finally he said, I have given my word. I will do what is required. I will. I will take you to heaven. So what he did was, he decided to create his own heaven. 
Now, depending on the kind of power a person has, people can do different things. Somebody might want to buy a mansion. If they can't buy a mansion, they may say, I'll create a mansion with that. If they have enough money, they can do that. So he had power, and by that power, he started creating his own heaven. And as he started creating his own heaven, and he sent Trishanku over there. And Trishanku started living over there, and that was magnificently opulent, just like heaven. But what the problem is, that we human beings can create things. Although we can create things, and certainly we have creative ability with which we should create as far as possible, but creativity has to be used in a constructive way, not in a disruptive way. Our capacity is finite. So what happened? He created the heaven, but for sustaining the heaven, his karmic power, his mystic power was all getting exhausted. It's all getting exhausted. It's like somebody creates a, somebody gets an expensive plane and they start flying all around in the plane. But then the plane's fuel is continuously getting exhausted, 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 exhausted. And then he started realizing that this planet is going to crash because his karmic power is getting exhausted. So sometimes what happens, we do something just out of ego. Yes, I want to demonstrate how great I can be. I was once traveling in a train in India and I saw someone, it is a crowded train, I saw someone with a bead bag. So I was surprised, no, I was happy to see somebody who is a devotee and talk with him. So he says, how are you introduced to Krishna consciousness? What consciousness? <laughs> he says, oh, I said, isn't that your bead bag? It, and I noticed then it was in left hand. I thought maybe it's his lefty. What? It's not not my bead bag. Then what is it? That is my nail bag. He says, what bag? It says nail bag. He said he was competing to get the Guinness Book of World Record entry for the longest nail in the world. Oh. <laughs> so he had a he had a bag in his hand, nail bag it was. <laughs> so then eventually it seems that he did uh, get that award. And after he got that award, you know, it's like uh, he had to let his nail go for go for something like I later read in the news about it. it. Like he had to let his nail grow for seven years, and that means seven years he worked with only one hand. Because you know, if your nail is growing in one hand, you cannot really use it. There's no hand in there for no use. And then he won that award, and he was very happy. But after that, after winning the award, he decided I'll cut my nail. But when he cut his nail. He found that his hand had become atrophied. Because he had not used the hand for seven years, the hand had become atrophied. And although he had a hand, it had become like paralyzed. He just couldn't use it at all. So sometimes we may try to do something just for the sake of achieving it. And now, of course, we all want to achieve in life. Yesterday uh, we were discussing this. You know, as devotees, can, can devotion and ambition go together? It's to, to, to live is to want to grow. So we all were unicellular organisms at one time. Now we have millions of cells. We are we are at various stage of growth in our body. So growth is a natural condition of life. But cancer is also growth. And cancer is growth that is disproportionate and destructive. So when one part of the body starts growing so much that it starts destroying other parts of the body, that is destructive, that, that is unhealthy, that can be even fatal. So similarly, ambition, which you said the desire for growth, that is just natural. Now we want to grow socially, we may grow to grow, grow our family, we want to grow our social connections, we want to grow financially, we want to grow in every, we want to grow spiritually. Growth is just a natural desire. It's not that to become spiritual means we suppress this natural tendency toward growth. But it is that we have to make sure that no aspect of growth becomes disproportionate. Sometimes some people become like there are work alcoholics, there are workaholics. Now workaholism is actually what you can call it's a prestigious addiction. It's addiction, but it's it's a compulsion, but it's prestigious. 
oh, you know, this person works 12 hours, 14 hours, this person works throughout the weekend. Oh, such a hardworking person. But the problem with that is, as people, they might become successful in their career, but then they're just lonely. They have no time there for their family, they have no time for their health. They have no time for nourishing themselves also. Many times if you're an alcoholic, what happens is, people lose their health to gain wealth. And then as they hit middle age, and thereafter, the body starts going through a miracle of the wrong kind. And then they have to spend their wealth to gain their health. <laughs> and in the end, they lose both their health and their wealth. So we don't want to be disproportionate. Achievement is not a problem, but obsession with trying to achieve something just to show the world how great I am, without the overall picture of life's purpose, that is destructive. So Vishwamitra had power, but what happened? He got sidetracked. First he got sidetracked by desire, by sensual temptation. Then he got sidetracked by anger. Then he got sidetracked by arrogance. I want to demonstrate to the world how great I am. That desire can be very, very unhealthy. Even in our spiritual life, we don't have to demonstrate to the world how spiritually advanced we are. Our purpose is to actually be spiritually advanced, to be connected with Krishna. And if you are connected with Krishna, that's wonderful. We will be absorbed in him and we will attain him. So finally after this happened, as the planet started collapsing, 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 the, the heavenly planet started crumbling down, he said, help, help, he said, whom should I pray to now? He said, he said the only person who can help me is Vishnu. And he fervently started praying to Vishnu. Oh Lord Vishnu, please, please help me, help me. And he started praying. Anyway, of course he was a sage. He had scriptural knowledge. And he started offering prayers. And seeing his fervent prayers, Vishnu appeared over there. And when Vishnu appeared over there, Vishnu balanced that. And then he said that his, this Trishanku's desire was unhealthy. It was a disharmonious desire. And in satisfying his disharmonious desire, you have created disharmony in the universe. Now we may want to please someone or satisfy their desires. But you know which what desire is it? Love is not just satisfying any desire of someone whom we love. Sometimes love also means saying no to someone. If parents start pandering to every desire of their children, then the child may say, I want to eat a hundred chocolates in one day. And then the parents can become effectively, not intentionally, but effectively in terms of effect, the parents can become the enemies of the children if the parents start pandering to every desire of the child. So Vishnu told him, he is immature. Even if he had a desire like that, why did you pander to that desire? Don't lose your power like this. Don't get distracted. And then Vishwamitra expected repentance. And he said that Trishanku, because he had this desire uh, to go to heaven and he manipulated you for this, so he will be suspended in between. So nowadays Trishanku is used as a symbol in India that something is suspended in between. So if there's a recently there was elections in India, of course one, one party won the majority. But if, if no party wins the majority, the parliament is hung. They said that parliament is in a Trishanku state now. <laughs> it's in between, neither here nor there, like that. But now this contact with Vishnu purified Vishwamitra. And then he continued performing his austerities. And he performed his austerities. And finally, the power within him became so strong, so concentrated that fire started emanating from within him. And then the God said, what to do? The God looked at Indra and Indra started looking away. He said, I have tried everything now. I have tried all temptations, but nothing has worked. So then, you know, when we have a problem, a child has a, if a child has a problem, the child may go to an elder brother. The elder brother can't solve it, and then go to the parents. If there's a bully who is troubling, then the parents may decide to go to that person's parents, or may go to the principle of the school or whatever. So we escalate problems to different levels depending on the size of the problem. Uh, it's, it, if somebody doesn't have proper intelligence, 
the smallest problem they may escalate to the biggest level that's not required so anyway the point is they'll realize that indra can't solve so they decided to go to brahma and they told brahma vishwamitra is performing such austerities what do we do so brahma said that i'll go down personally and brahma appeared in front of vishwamitra and he said you have performed extraordinary austerities and your willingness to to continue your austerity for so long despite so many distractions that shows that you have actually earned the merit to be a sage you are a rishi you are a brahma rishi now at this point he heard this but still his heart was not satisfied he wanted to hear this from vashishta he wanted to my rival should acknowledge my glory so then what happened was that at that time seeing this seeing this all that happened uh, vashishta is related to brahma as a son so vashishta also came over there there's a genealogical connection between them so he said and vashishta said oh vishwamitra you are now a brahma rishi and as soon as he spoke this at that time what happened he attained his desire he attained his desire and all the anger all the resentment all the competitive mentality within him suddenly disappeared what happened over there was we may start our spiritual life for any motive but if we continue in our spiritual life and especially if we connect with the lord that connection with the lord will purify us so now he got the status of brahma rishi but he felt there must be something more in life he felt what is the, 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 so the story doesn't end over here although often the story of he uh, sorry of vishwamitra con concludes his, his attaining the status of brahma rishi but from being a brahma rishi he attained bhakti and that is demonstrated in the ramayana so vishwamitra story is told by a sage shatananda shatananda is the uh, is the priest of uh, janak rishi janak king janak who is janak sita sita madari yeah. so just as vashishta is the sage of the uh, ragu dynasty similarly janak shatananda is sage of the sage, uh, sage in the dynasty of the king of mithila so then as they came, as he, came, he told this whole story but the point of the story was that when he, because he had that contact with vishnu now he attained the brahma rishi stage but he felt there must be something more and he looked back and he thought you know my deepest contentment my deepest satisfaction was when i was have beholding the darshan of vishnu so that is what i want that is what i want a devotion and because the desire was sincere so it was arranged for him to play a vital role in the past time of lord of the supreme lord when he descended to this world so when vishnu descended and ram appeared in this world at that time vishwamitra got the opportunity to be his guru uh, not not diksha guru but a shiksha guru he told, taught him martial arts so now i just conclude with this aspect of story i won't go to the full story but two points i'll highlight in this that when vishwamitra came to the palace of dashrath maharaj now normally kings would go to sages to meet them and if they if they have something very important then the king the very very important the sages would come to meet the king So when Vishwamitra was a very powerful sage, he came to meet. It was it was it was caused curiosity and concern. What is so serious a problem? And he said there are demons who are troubling. Who are those demons? Vishwamitra Vishwa said I will fight. I'll take my whole army and fight against them. I don't want you or your army. I want your son Ram. But he's just a small child. He's just he's just so young. He's never fought a war till now. How will he fight? So Vishwamitra immediately. although he had controlled his anger but still he had the reputation of being a short tempered person so his anger started his anger his eyes started flaring up his eyes became red he said you had promised 
when I when you are receiving me, that you will satisfy my desire. So are you going to dishonor your word now? At that time, Vashishtha immediately took Dashita aside and told him that Vishwamitra himself is capable of destroying the demons. If he wants Ram to come, he will empower, he will give Ram the necessary weapons, and he will glorify Ram through this. And then he said, actually, Ram, your son is not, he's not just your son, he's the Supreme Lord descended to the world. See, for those who are very close devotees of the Lord, like the Vrajivasis and Vrindavan, or even the Ashwat Maharaj, they, they know at one level that Ram is God or Krishna is God, but they don't know it at a practical level. That means that in the reciprocation with him, the affection is so great that the awareness of God's greatness goes into the background. Just like in the daytime, also the stars are there in the sky. But the sun is so bright that we can't see the stars. Similarly, the love for the Lord is so great for, in his intimate devotees that the knowledge of his, that, that love becomes like the sun and the knowledge of his divinity becomes like the stars. It's just in the background. So anyway, when Vashishta persuaded him, Dashrath allowed like that. And then when he went with Vishwamitra, Ram went and Lakshman also came with him. Then Vishwamitra gave them the Ati Bala and Ati Bala Mahaman, Mahaman, the mantras. And then using those mantras, although Ram was especially just a young boy at that time, but he fought and he brought down Subahu and he brought down Tataka and then he sent Maricha by the airways far, far away. And this was a spectacular feat. These demons were so powerful that they just, uh, nobody could defeat them. And he just F so easily overpowered them. It was stunning. See, there are different ways we can glorify someone. Now, one way to glorify is just to speak the glories of someone. Now, Vishwamitra, because he's such an old sage, and Ram is young, in that particular service, he doesn't directly glorify Ram. Oh, you are so glorious, you are so glorious, you are glorious. One way to glorify someone is just to praise that person. But another way to glorify someone is to give them a forum where their glories can be manifested. So, the devotees would do glorification of Prabhupada and Vyas Puja. But the devotees would also go out of their way uh, to organize big programs for Prabhupada. Where Prabhupada would speak and attract people's hearts. So there are different ways in which glorification can be done. So what Vishwamitra's service was, that he arranged for Ram's glorification. The first way he glorified him was, at a young age, he overpowered great demons. Then he decided, there's another way I want to glorify Ram. I want to reveal Ram's glories to the whole world. And that way was, let us go. Here, just, okay, you kill some demons, uh, but who, who will know about it? Many people may not know. But let us go to a place where all, where all the great kings have assembled. What was that place? Sita. Yeah, the Swayamvar of Sita in, ja in Janakpuri. And there, they had got a uh, um, big, big bow of Shiva. And that bow of Shiva was so great that nobody could lift it. You know, applause can be for appreciation, applause can be for conclusion also. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll finish in a few minutes. <laughs> now, uh, when here all the top, all the greatest warriors had come and they had the, this bow of Shiva which Trambak Karmuka Bhanjakarama. Trambak is the name of Lord Shiva. Karmuk and this is bow Bhanjaka. Uh, Lord Ram, not only it strung it, he, he broke it. It's such a heavy bow that ordinary people couldn't even lift it. But then the test was when Sita was just a small girl, she was, uh, she was learning how to keep the house and how to clean the house and she went to this place and she said, she said okay, I will clean this bow also. And she just picked up the bow. 
the the maids who were there with her they saw they fainted what is this the man of them ran and told dashrat mar dashrat couldn't believe it and he came and he saw he saw sita was nonchalantly lifting the bow and just wiping it and he said is sita she has such power she needs a really powerful king as her husband and if that king is not powerful enough she has such power if she just embraces him what will happen to him <laughs> so she decided that sita has lifted this bow so her husband should at least uh, to be husband should be able to at least string the bow so what happens in the bow the force with which the arrow is discharged depends on how much tension is there in the bow that's why the bow is normally like this and when it's tight it bends so to now to bend to string the bow requires a lot of strength because the bow has to be bent for stringing it so said who will string the bow and all the great kings had come over there and nobody could string that bow and then finally he actually even ravan had come over there but even ravan couldn't string it and finally ram came over there and when ram came to the central assembly he just came there he circumambulated the bow and then he folded his hands and he just put his hand down just nonchalantly picked up the bow a complete hush fell over the assembly they were astounded waiting to see what is going to happen and they took the string and he pulled it and they pulled it pulled the string around the other end he pulled it and tied it such force such a thunderous sound came over there and everybody over there fainted and in the see the human body has certain capacity to withstand stimuli so the stimuli go beyond their capacity our brain turns off and one way it turns off is by fainting and finally they came back to consciousness what happened vishwamitra was standing there proudly looking at his student his pride was spiritual that he knew is not a student is the lord and then sita arpita varmalika rama sita came over there and she offered the varmala she offered the garland to ram and thus vishwamitra got to do this intimate service of uniting lakshmi with narayan of uniting sita with ram and that is the ultimate success of his spiritual journey so for all of us that is our success also now whatever sita and lakshmi represent the resources of this world the purpose of bhakti is to unite the resources of the world with the source of the world and whatever we are doing in our life ultimately if we are doing that in whichever way we can do it that is the success of our devotion just as vishwamitra overcame many distractions and persevered and ultimately was able to do render render intimate service to the lord now we may not enter into the past times and render that particular kind of service but his story demonstrates how if we also persevere on the spiritual path then we also can attain life supreme perfection i'll summarize I spoke about Vishwamitra journey today, and I started by talking about how Scripture talks about timeless truths. That although the external situations we may face in the world may be very different, but the real challenges we face are not the external situations, but the inner weaknesses. And Scripture guides us in timeless truths. Just like changes in our mode of transportation don't change. the fact that the sun and the moon are needed for illumination they light the sky similarly scripture gives timeless truths and the timeless truths are about how we can overcome our inner obstacles so vishwamitra story talks about how we the search for power all of us have some kind of now nobody come, very few people come to spiritual life with a pure motive but whatever motive we come for but if we stay perseverant we will gradually get purified so it is the search for power it made him first gain do astral to get kshatriya weapons then to get brahmanical weapons but first he was thwarted in recognizing that material power can't counter spiritual power so i want to get some higher spiritual power but he wanted spiritual power 
for material purposes to demonstrate that I am so great in this world. He tried that and first he was distracted by desire, by Menakaki. Then he came again, he tried and then he was distracted by anger. So I talked about how the more self-control we get, the more we get the, con maybe get the conception that the self is the controller. And the more we may start becoming intolerant of anyone who disrupts the control, contro our control of our situation. So therefore, uh, Kama Anuja is Krodha. When desire is conquered, wherever desire is present, but it is controlled, uh, anger can come up. So he cursed Aramba and thus he again lost his power. But he recovered. Although he got distracted, he refocused again. And then another distraction for him was because of pride, of arrogance. He tried to prove his superiority over Vashishta by trying to take Trishanku up to the heavens in his self-same body. Because, uh, and he could, in, he became like a, Trishanku became like a tennis ball in between. And he lost all his power. He created alternative heavens, but he realized I can't sustain it. So we all want to achieve some things in life. But if achievement becomes an obsession for us, it becomes, we want to achieve just for the sake of achievement, then that obsession is unhealthy. It's like growth and ambition are natural. But obsession is like cancerous growth. It's destructive. So everything needs to be kept in proportion in our lives. And then finally, he performed immense austerities till he, well, Brahmaji came him, came there and Vashishtha also came there. And they acknowledged that he is a Brahma Rushi. But before that, when his planet was collapsing, he had contact with Vishnu. And Vishnu told him that, you are wiser than Trishanku, so you needn't have fulfilled, abandoned to his disharmonious desire. But because that contact with Vishnu was there, even if it was not exactly a devotional contact with the intention for pure devotion, but that devotional contact, that devotional impression remained. And eventually, even after becoming Brahma Rishi, which was his starting goal, but that goal, after achieving it also, he realized that's not enough. Then it is, he got Bhakti. And because his desire to serve the Lord was genuine, sincere, so he got entry into the Lord. It's past times when he came as Ram. And there are different ways of glorifying someone. One is simply to praise them. The other is to facilitate them to act in a way that their glories can be spread. So Vishwamitra played that role for Ram by giving him a forum where he as a small, as a young child, young boy, young boy could also kill great demons. And then as a suitor, he won the hand of Sita amidst all the most powerful kings and princes of the world at that time. And thus Vishwamitra's success, spiritual journey culminated in he being able to unite Sita with Ram, Lakshmi with Narayan. Similarly, our spiritual journey's ultimate purpose is that all the resources that we have, we unite them with the source of everything. And that is something which we all can get inspiration from Vishwamitra's journey. Whatever distractions come, we stay alert to avoid getting distracted. But even if we get distracted, we recover and we resume our journey till we attain perfection. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Yes, I'm going to go. So thank you again for a fascinating class, Prabhu. Very inspiring. So the, the question is, um, it's a two-pronged question if it's okay. Yes, please. So one is, uh, how did we understand the Trishanku pastime where he was trying to go with the same body to the heavenly kingdom uh, versus uh, you know the pastimes that we read from Srimad Bhagavatam where kings like Machukunda and Katwanga and even the grandson of Vishwamitra actually go and fight for uh, the demigods in the heavenly planet. So is that they get uh, a different body and then they come back? So that's the first part of okay. the question. The second one is... Uh, uh, not related though, but uh, how do we understand uh, Indra's uh, position? Because we read uh, in so many pastimes where he makes mistakes again okay. and again. Uh, hmm. 
Okay, so the first question is, how do we hear about kings going to heavens and fighting for the gods? You see, there are, the whole point is that there is a cosmic hierarchy. And in that hierarchy, there are certain authorized ways in which one person from this level can go to that level. So you could say that, uh, um, as I give the example of levels of access in a computer system. Now one way for uh, say a uh, data entry operator to get access to confidential files is that that person goes, grows in that position till they become a big manager. Now another way is that if that manager specifically want this data operator to do some work then they may give that permission and if that permission is given that is also considered as privilege special privilege so arjun also arjuna is also able to go to heaven uh, and he not only goes to heaven but he's, he gets to sit on indra's throne with him because indra treats him like a son come and sit on the throne with him so he says prapto mahendra bhavane mahadasanardham so Krishna, uh, so Arjuna remembers that he, although Krishna is not directly involved in his pastime, he credits it because of Krishna's grace, I was able to go to heaven and attain heaven. So the devtas, if they want, they can take someone and temporarily grant them that power. So if they want somebody to fight on their behalf, then they can give them that power. Or if they want somebody, uh, they are especially pleased with someone, then they can do that. But it is not by our force that we can get there. And the second question about Indra, why does, uh, why does Indra seem to commit so many mistakes? He always seems to be getting into trouble. Isn't it? We have Govardhan Leela and then we have so many other pastimes. Where Now the point is that Indra is a very respectable person. And especially if you consider the Rig Veda and the Vedic literature, he is considered the 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 perfect example of success in karma kanda that you know you do proper yajna draw pro proper uh, tapa draw proper punya and then you will become indra so indra is a great position but in the path of bhakti everything see, every book has its purpose the bhakti literature primarily they may have various purposes but the central point is to glorify that's fine. So, the purpose of the bhakti literature is to glorify the path of bhakti. So now, to glorify the path of bhakti, how do they do that? By showing that even the greatest success on the path of karma, it can also commit blunders. But a bhakta doesn't commit that blunder. So say, give us, a, give us a example, say from cricket. Suppose somebody is a brilliant leg spinner. Hmm? And now you want to show how good leg spin bowling did us. I said there is a book on leg spin bowling. Now, now in that book if you read, they might show, okay, you know, how this batsman, you know, he, he got out. This leg spin ball made him out, then this leg spin ball made out. Now in that book if you read, all that you will see is, how that batsman gets out. Hmm. Now we think this batsman always gets out. Does he score any runs? <laughs> now that batsman might be a champion batsman. And the fact that that batsman is getting out is talked in that book is because he's a champion batsman. Isn't it? An ordinary batsman getting out, what's the big deal? <laughs> so if we want to look, uh, we want to read a book about batting, then we might see the exploits of that batsman. But if the book is about leg spin bowling, then you will only show the batsman getting out. So, Indra's book is the Vedas. So there, his exploits are described in great terms. But here, the Bhagavatam and the Bhakti literature generally focus on, on Bhakti itself. So they show how the greatest successes on the path of karma, they may like, champion batsmen in their own way, but, but when it comes to the force of illusion, this get overcome. That's why we, we shouldn't start thinking that Indra is childish or impulsive or or uh, or foolish he's a great person but in the path of bhakti as compared to the glory of bhakti and the stability and the spirituality that bhakti brings you know even the uh, power of indra becomes insignificant okay. 
Thank you. Hare Krishna. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, please. So sometimes the the big personalities like the demigods, they are put by providence in a certain position, which let's say from let's say a normal bhakti point of view is not good. Correct. But it's it's the, it's the situation is created on purpose. Yes. To give lesson to other, uh, let's say, aspirants yes. on the bhakti path, or to sages even. Like for example, when Lord Shiva wanted to see the Mohini Murti, Mohini Murti it was like a, a fall down from, from our point of view. But the purpose was that, uh, that's what Prabhupada writes in some purport, that the purpose was to show the sages. And Mohini Murti took Lord Shiva through different hermitages. And the lesson was for the sages to see, just see. Mm, it's beautiful, yeah, that's true. And just, so when, in, let's say Lord Shiva was, was chasing Mohini Murti, he went through the, the area of various sages. And as it was shown to the sages that the, that the particular person they are worshipping, he is also fallible. He can also get attracted. Yes, that's an important lesson for everyone. There's another lesson which Prabhupada talks about in the later verses over there that actually what is Shiva's consciousness? After he, after he falls, he doesn't feel humiliated. He's elated. He says, nobody except Vishnu could have made me fall like this. How great is Vishnu? So, he still is temporarily is captivated. But immediately he recovers. And he doesn't focus on his own, oh, my own mortification, my own humiliation. He focuses on the Lord. So even Shiva's greatness is also demonstrated. Not greatness in terms of that he is the supreme, but his great devotion to the supreme. With that, generally, when we practice uh, any kind of, uh, say we practice spirituality, then we, if we keep practicing for some time, we get certain respect in that community. And if that respect is taken away, then they to still keep practicing. We need to actually love Krishna more than our ego, more than we love our ego. And sometimes what happens, Krishna Bhakti can boost our ego also. So then, that's a very big test. So Shiva passes that test and what that pastime demonstrates is I gave a series of classes on this Mohini Murti pastime that you know, even if we can't succeed in Krishna Consciousness, we can fail in Krishna Consciousness, not fail out of Krishna Consciousness. That we shouldn't think of Krishna Consciousness as only success. Krishna Consciousness is not simply adhering to a set of standards. Krishna Consciousness is a state of Consciousness. And that Krishna consciousness can include success and it can include failure also. Of course, we want to succeed in terms of following the standards. But even if sometimes we slip and fall. So it's not that only when somebody follows their vows of purity, then they are Krishna conscious. If they fail in following their vows, but then they, that makes them humble. That makes me prayerful. That makes them call out to Krishna more. So they have failed, but they have failed in Krishna consciousness. To fail out of Krishna consciousness means to think that I tried this for so long, I couldn't succeed. This is not for me. This doesn't work. Maybe God doesn't exist. I don't care for this. Thank you, God. So, uh, well, even uh, another way to put it is we may fall down, but we don't have to fall away. Fall down is temporary. Okay, I was at the stand, I fell down. But I rise and come, rise up again and move on. Fall away means we give up the path of Bhakti. So Shiva's glory is also demonstrated in the paradoxical way over here. And he falls and Vishnu is so great that Vishnu can make even Shiva is considered to be dhir to fall. But Shiva is also so great that even after falling, he is not conscious of his own fall and his humiliation. He is conscious of the glory of Vishnu who has made him fall. So that he falls in Krishna consciousness, not out of Krishna consciousness. Okay. Thank you.
Yes, Ram. So the past time of Pirishangu Swarga, mm. so how does it fit in the normal current uh, situation? It's not like Vishnu sustains that. Mm. So that means it's a part of our universe too. So now after the uh, death, you know, uh, the desire, so is it a desire realm where human beings pass, spend time there and desire their body? Uh, okay. Is Trishanku a particular level of uh, arena where people go through, all souls go through, or we human beings go through? Not necessarily. It, certain exceptional things might be created for particular purposes. But that doesn't mean that becomes a part of the standard for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I don't. And the way to describe Trishanku's state is not like a very comfortable state. It's that he is there in that state of suspended animation. And uh, how long he will be, it depends on the karma. And then he will be elevated. So it's not. Uh, so it's something which is like an emergency because he, Vishnu, because Vishwamitra created it, and Vishwamitra prayed to Vishnu. So Vishnu sustained that particular arrangement for Trishanku, but not for everyone. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Another one. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> yes, please. So, um, I think my, my, my question is uh, all these understandings that you're presenting here, these are all substantiated by all the commentaries by the Acharyas in general? Or is there some modern day understanding? Here like what? Means which specific understanding? Okay. So, how do we answer those people who say, well, this is sort of uh, like you said, it's just rather than being historical, it's just a creation by all these sages and things like that? Well, there are a lot of questions over there. No, I'm trying to formulate the question. Okay. Let me repeat it and then I'll say. How much time do we have to Okay. Well, okay, so how much is, say, what I spoke on based on Acharyas or is it contemporary understanding? And many people try to give allegorical understanding of scripture where they don't, they don't focus on the point that it is historical. And some people say that this is actually not history. This is just allegory. So how do we respond to these concerns? Okay. Madhvacharya in his Brahma Sutra Bhashya states that the Itihasas can be understood at three levels. He talks about literal, ethical and metaphorical. So literal means this is what happened. And just hearing it, reciting it is purifying. Ek ek aksharam pumsam mahapatakanashanam about the Ramayana, it is said that just reciting the Ramayana can purify us. So literally, this is how it happened. Now, we could say equate literal with historical. Now, actually the word literal is also, a, you could say, a post-Newtonian word, word. What do you mean by that? That when, whenever history was told, it's only in the modern scientific worldview uh, that History is all about precise recapitulation of facts. In the past, whether it is India or if you say Homer's Odyssey or other books in the Greek or Roman tradition that are written, even if you see Julius Caesar, what Shakespeare wrote, the point of, of giving a historical narrative was not to just give a literal replication of facts. The point of studying history 
was moral edification, was to learn something worthwhile from history. Of course, I think Will Durant was a famous historian said that what we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. <laughs> that means people keep committing the same mistakes again and again and again. But the point is that in the past, the focus was not so much on giving literal facts. So are the scriptures historical? Of course. But is that history in the same sense as we talk about history today? Not necessary. Nowadays, history is simply about giving facts. But scripture's focus is not on giving facts. It's not that they're not giving facts. The focus is on, is on giving lessons, giving wisdom. And that's why we don't, uh, we, of course, we don't deny the historicity of scripture. But it is not that every single thing that is told in scripture has to necessarily be literal. Because scripture is poetry. If you see the Bhagavad Gita is saying, Yani Shah Sarva Bhutanam Tasyam Jagati Sayyam, Yasyam Jagati Bhutani Sani Shah Pasha That's 269, which says that that which is night for all living beings is a day for self realized. That which is day for the all living beings is night for the self realized. Now, day and night are the same for everyone, isn't it? If you take it literally, unless you want to say that you know all self realized, self -realized people are in India. All materialistic people are in North America. So, what is when it's day in India, it, night in North America? <laughs> that would be quite a stretched interpretation, isn't it? So, here day and night are not literal. Day and night refer to area of knowledge and area of activity. You know, when can we see clearly? Where are we going to act, function actively? So, there is definitely poet artistic license in scripture. Now we won't go into which part is historical, which is not, because that's a detailed discussion. But the principle is that although scripture is history, it is not like history in today's world. It is history presented poetically. So if somebody says that there are poetic exaggerations or poetic ornament, the word exaggeration is negative. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also in Chaitanya Charitamrita uses the word that, uh, he says that the great poets have glorified Krishna in various ways using figures of speech such as hyperbole. The specific word in Chaitanya Charitamrita is Atishoyakti. Atishoyakti is hyperbole. So now we don't say that, okay, the whole idea of this and everything in scripture is hyperbole. But it is poetry. And poetry includes hyperbole. So, but that is for a poetic purpose. So that's the first point. When you say that it's, 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 it's historical, it's not history like it is right now. And getting caught in the pedantic debates. Is it like this? Is it like that? That's, that's, we shouldn't get too much caught in it. Now, Prabhupada in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam says that the Krishna has gone returning from Hastinapur to Dwarka and the Bhagavatam describes the path which he took. He went through this kingdom, this kingdom, this kingdom, this kingdom and then he comes. And he said, he says that some historians, some geologists may try to, some historians may try to retrace the path of Krishna which he took. But he says the earth surface because of geology keeps changing constantly. And retracing the path can be quite a difficult task. As far as we are concerned, we are simply satisfied that Krishna has reached Dwarka and is going to perform pastimes with Dwarka devotees. So, what is Prabhupada is focused. This is not to uh, deny the importance or the validity of some research into Krishna's historicity. But the point is keep things in perspective. That is secondary. The primary thing in studying the Ramayana and the Ramabharata is to learn the devotional and the ethical values by which you can remember the Lord. So I'm taking it from, it's, it's literal, it's historical, if you want to use the word historical, but it's not just historical, there are ethical lessons. The primary purpose of history in the past was to teach ethical lessons, what to do and what not to do. And beyond that, it's because it's poetry, some metaphorical things might also be there. So what is a matter of concern, especially for Srila Prabhupada was, when the metaphorical was used not to supplement the historical, but to supplant the historical, to replace it. So if somebody says the Kurukshetra war never took place, Kurukshetra just represents the body. Now you can say Kurukshetra represents the body and you can say that, uh, okay, you say the Kauravas are more, more than the Pandavas. We can say our unholy desires are more than the holy desires. That is okay. But when somebody uses that to say Kurukshetra is not historical at all. That is where Prabhupada's strong concern was. Prabhupada also in his works, he is not very... Common, but he has used metaphorical explanation. He's talking about how 
uh, Devaki's womb represents our heart and how the first six children came and were killed. That is like six Anarthas going out. Balram is the guru coming in and cleaning the heart. And then Krishna appears over there. So we shouldn't be uh, paranoid about the metaphorical explanations. But we shouldn't make a meta metaphorize everything. And certainly scripture itself is not to be metaphorized. There, there may be some, some things within scripture which are metaphorical and what it is that can be specifically discussed. So that is, I would say, the balanced understanding that people who say that uh, this is just uh, um, this is just uh, poetic myths, we don't have to immediately go on the war path with them. We understand where they are coming from. Yes, technology this is poetry. There may be exaggerations. We don't have to concede that everything is exaggeration. But ultimately, our point is to get them to accept the wisdom. So, if somebody says, "I can't believe that demons exist." I am going to say that as long, unless you believe that demons exist, you shouldn't chant Hare Krishna. If you tell me I have to accept demons exist, I will not chant Hare Krishna. Well, better start chanting and then gradually as purification happens, things will, things will grow. You know, Prabhupada was once asked that uh, in Hawaii, some devotees asked him, I was just in Hawaii a few uh, month or two ago. So, I was talking with a devotee who happened to be there at that time and Prabhupada was asked. Some devotee said, Prabhupada, when we talk with the scholars, and we tell the scholars that that in Dwarka, King Ugrasen had like astronomical number of bodyguards. So they start laughing at us. We say that, you know, how could, where did they all live? Where were their houses? Where were their toilets? How would they live? Now Prabhupada could have said that Krishna can do anything. But, and, but Prabhupada chose a completely different time. He said, among thousands of verses in the Bhagavatam, did you find only that verse to that verse to talk about to people, to the scholars? We have limited time with people, and we want to give the most important message that we have. So we need to, in we don't want to compromise, but we don't want to create confrontation also. So somehow or the other, inject the seed of Krishna Bhakti in people. So even if somebody is initially not ready to accept. That it is, uh, this is all historical. If somebody is saying everything is mythological or metaphorical, then that's, uh, that's a matter of consideration. What do they mean by mythological? But if somebody just starts taking the principles and applying them, gradually understanding will come. And as far as the explanations which I gave, are they uh, based on traditional commentaries? It depends on what we are talking about. In general, Prabhupada said that Realization means to present things in a way that is interesting to the audience. So, we take scriptural concepts and give contemporary examples to illustrate those concepts. So that, that those now explicitly the idea of a mainframe computer may not be there in scripture. So that, that metaphor will not be there in scripture. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that metaphor is not serving the purpose of scripture. The idea is that we need to not just get it right, we need to get it across. Say, if somebody comes and gives a perfect class in Sanskrit and nobody understands that class, you got everything right, you got nothing across. Is it? Prabhupada's stress in general was on getting it across. Mm. So for example, in 15.6 purport, there, it's a, the, 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 the literal translation says that uh, in that spiritual world, it, that it is, there is no need for it. The spiritual world is not illuminated by sun, moon or... No, that, that's not there in the actual translation. <laughs> Pavaka, fire. But Prabhupada adds electricity over there. Now somebody who might be a very literal, again, a literalist over there. Where is electricity over there? There's no electricity over here. See, the point is, if you look at that verse, this is 15.6, and the same thing comes later in 15.12, that Krishna is saying, the same three places, the objects he uses, Yadaditya gatam tejo jagat bhasete akhilam ya chandrabasi ya chagnam tattejo vidhima amakam he says that this world is illuminated by the sun, moon and fire and their capacity to illumine comes from me. So the stress over there 
is to contrast the material and the spiritual world and to stress that the spiritual world is self-effulgent. It doesn't require any external source of illumination. Now, to get this point across, you know, most people live today in such an artificial world. You know, if you, there was some survey done that if you ask a five-year-old Western child, where does milk come from? It's from the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even know milk comes from the cow. Milk comes from a cow. So, so for most people, if you ask, uh, where does light come from? It comes from electricity. If there's no electricity, there's no light. If there's electricity, light comes. So, to to convey the point that it's not that the spiritual world is not self effulgent is it doesn't depend on the external source of light, extra source of light. So, Prabhupada to get that point across adds electricity over there. So what is he doing? The important thing is not just to get it right. Yes, we, the important thing is to get it across. So as long as the essential, Prabhupada talks about realizing three things. He said first thing is that no unscrupulous meaning should be screwed out. The uh, purpose of the scripture should be served and the message should be presented in a way that is interesting to the audience. So as long as by giving certain examples, if people's understanding of Krishna Bhakti, appreciation of Krishna Bhakti, interest to try to explore and practice Krishna Bhakti is increased, then that is serving the purpose. Okay. So thank you very much. Shla Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrind ki, Dai Gaur Premanande.